Beginning in verse 11, this is a parable that the Lord had given. And it, it sounds much like the parable of the talents, but it's a little different. And this is called the parable of the pounds. And we're going to study this a little bit this morning. And, and I pray that we're going to read just a little bit here. So you might want to take a little deep breath and relax a little bit. And we're going to read this parable. Uh, it says in verse 11 of Luke 19. Amen. It says, And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, your pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And then second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up, that thou laidest not down, and reapest, that thou didst not sow. And they said unto him, Out of your own mouth will I judge thee. Out of your own mouth will I judge thee. Thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou the money unto the bank, that at my coming I might have required my own with usury? And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given it. And from him that hath not, even that which he hath shall be taken from him. But those my enemies, which were not that I should reign over them, bring here and slay them before me. Amen. Let's bow our hearts together. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and I ask that you would give me the words to say, the words to teach and to preach, that it would be all of you and none of me, that you would let me be only a vessel, and that my thoughts, my flesh, everything of myself would be crucified completely and utterly with Christ. And Lord, let your Holy Spirit go forth. It is only your Spirit and what you have to say that is worth listening to. We bind the enemy away that would seek to pervert the Word of God or to distort it or to blind eyes and plug ears. Lord, we ask that you would go forth in your power and might. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The parable of the pounds, Jesus would give this, and it doesn't take that much discernment or discretion to be able to understand what Jesus is saying here in this parable. He has said that there was a man, and of course he is that man, and he would go and he was going to go to a far country, and he left ten servants in charge, and he gave each one and distributed to each one something that they were to do. And he says, Occupy till I come. And so this is what the church has been doing for 2,000 years. We have taken that which God has entrusted us, and we have been told to occupy, to do with what He has given us. And there's really two different things in this parable. There are the servants. Some of them are true, and some of them are wicked. And then there are citizens that hated Him. 
that hated the Lord. And you know, there are people yet today that speak with their mouth about Jesus. And this is not new. It has happened from the very beginning. I said Wednesday night that you can read in Revelation the first three chapters of Revelation as Jesus is giving a heart-to-heart -heart letter to His churches. He calls them His pastors, the ones that He holds in His hands. And He gives to them this letter directly to them, to each one of them. And He speaks to each one of them. And it is clear that with it, it had the, He has not even been up and sat upon the right hand of God the Father for a hundred years in the hearts of men. Before he is telling them, you have to repent of your sins to come back to your first love. Paul said that when he would go, he knew that there was going to be ravaging wolves that would be loosed upon them and would seek to devour and to distort, to distort the gospel. Jesus no longer or no sooner ascended up into heaven and there was already people and the enemy went to work to distort and pervert the word of truth. And it is going on even yet today. And it's even more so as we get closer to the end of time where this, the soon return of Jesus is to come. John says that little children in the last days, there would be many antichrists, there would be many false prophets and teachers and spirits. And he says that even the spirit of the antichrist is already right now in, the wor in work in this world. And in fact, in truth, if it's not Jesus Christ and Him crucified and our trust and submission to Him alone then it is Antichrist. I think you can divide everything up into that. There isn't a gray area. It's either Jesus Christ alone and we submit to His will and perfect authority, yes. or else every other religion, every other denomination, every other way of thought, every other humanistic mind thought, it is Antichrist. Yes. It's either Jesus Christ or it's Antichrist, and there's no other in between. And we're serving one or the other. And he says here, occupy till I come. But it says here that his citizens hated him. And they said in their heart, he will not rule over me. And I want to give us this thought today. And I want us to look into our heart. Is Jesus truly the ruler of our life? We can all nod our head and say, yes, he is the Lord of my life. But if he is the Lord of our life, he is who we submit to. It is He that our thoughts go to. He is our lover. He is our Savior. He is our everything. I just yesterday had read the Song of Solomon. If you haven't read it, read it. It is eight beautiful chapters that depicts the love of Jesus Christ towards His bride. How much He loves us. How much He longs for us. And He cares for us. But let me say this. It's not a one-way thing. The bride loves the bridegroom. But I want to give us this thought today. Are you in love with the Lord Jesus Christ? Is He your lover today? Do you wake up with Him in your thoughts? If you have any type of romance in your heart, recollect when you were young and in love. When you were so infatuated with the one that you gave your heart to. And you woke up and it was he or she that you thought of and it was he or she you that you longed to be with and when you were apart, your heart literally ached for that one. There's many romantic stories that we've heard of in our, in our, in our life and fairy tales even. But let me say that it all has come forth from one source, yes. from one well, and it comes forth from the great I Am and His love that He had for His bride and that He would long to be with her so grand. And there was, there was a separation that had been divided and He had to send forth His beloved Son to give His own life to bring her back to Him. This is the story of the cross of Jesus Christ. But how many of us say, now the Lord will not reign in my heart. I love Him. But we deny Him in our, in our works. We deny Him in our walk. We say we're in love with Him, but yet our eyes look after lust for others. Our heart craves the, the passion and the, and the feel and the goosebumps of a stranger. 
All of these things that I'm speaking of, and I'm getting off track of where I was with this, but it's all right because I, I feel the Lord leading this way. When you look at the romance that we think of today, you can take the old fairy tale Cinderella and you can take all the romance that you can think of that are written in novels and portrayed in movies and you can take it all. But it all has come from the source. It has been actually tainted by the fingerprints of man to be interpreted as something else. Because marriage in itself yeah. is designated by God to be a type between us, to us, so it's ever before us, of our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why today, same-sex marriage, it is an abomination to God because it, is, it ruins the type of which the Bible would portray between the bride and its bridegroom. Yes. When we look at fornication, sex outside of marriage, within the church even, the world goes to hell anyway. We can't expect them to do anything else. But right within the church, yes. people committing fornication and they don't even blink at it. It's an abomination. And the Bible says don't even think for one moment that a fornicator will enter into the kingdom of God. It ain't going to happen. Because it ruins the type that marriage is between a man and a woman as they've come together and they've submitted to a covenant. And they've cherished and promised their hearts for one another. And it is done by a vow before God. And how many of you know there's a lot of Christians in church today that profess to know God, but they deny Him. They've not vowed their heart to Him. When I married my wife, I went before a pastor and a bunch of people. And more importantly, I stood before God. And I said I would promise and I would vow to love her and to cherish her through sickness and in health. No matter what things and feelings I had and emotions that came up in my life, I would be true to her. I would be faithful to her. And that's what the Christian vows to Jesus Christ when we give Him our life. Yes. But we have today a, a cheap vow where we say a prayer, but we deny it in our walk. Let me tell you, bride, if you come before the groom in a white dress and you vow to love Him and cherish Him, but on your wedding night, you go out and you sleep with other men. You have denied Him in your, in your life, in your very fruit. And that's what we do to Jesus. The bride says, yes, I love Him. But yet in our heart, our eyes look after humanistic psychology. And we look after idols made of our imaginations. We love the world and we fit in good with it. And it ought not to be so for the pure and perfect spotless bride they say they hate him and they say he will not rule our lives he won't reign over us I don't want his ways with our lips we say fine pure things we say I'll love you and I'll cherish you but we go home and we deny him in our life let it not be for the bride let it not be for the church he is coming back for a church that is without spot and without wrinkle, the Bible says. Even the pure white bridal gown that we are traditionally known to wear in our weddings, it all is a type of the Word. Where did these things come from? Why did these things become traditions? Because Christian people recognize the type. But even today, the Bible says in the last days they would deny marriage. We're seeing it all over. People having relations outside of marriage, having children outside of wedlock, all of these things ruin the type of the bride of Christ who has kept himself spotless and pure for her love, for her lover. And I want to tell us today, Jesus is coming back as the bridegroom. Yes. And he's coming back for a pure and perfect bride. And it says that she's waiting, looking out the window. She has her lamp. And she's brought extra oil. And though he has tarried, and he has been long in waiting, it says he came at midnight when they were asleep. But the five wise virgins had extra oil. And they knew he was coming. And they heard yeah. the bridegroom comes. Oh, yeah. And they woke up and they said, it's finally here. He's coming. Yeah. And they began to trim their, their wick. And they began to get their oil. And five foolish virgins, they looked like the right ones. They were playing church. They were virgins. They had lamps. 
but they had no oil. They had no power of the Holy Ghost in their life. They said in, in their heart, he won't rule over me. I don't really want him. If I really wanted him, I would be ready. If I really wanted him in my life, I would be right in my heart and I would live for him right now. Are we hearing me this morning? The five foolish virgins said to the five wise, give me your oil. We don't have enough. And the wise said, no, because we won't have enough if we give to you. You go and you buy some and hurry and come back. And it says, while they went to go buy, he came and the door was shut. And they beat outside and knocked and said, open unto us, please. And he said to them, I don't know you. Depart from me. How many are going to miss out on the rapture of the church because they're not a pure bride waiting for their love, Jesus Christ? They said in their heart, He will not reign over me. There's too many pleasures. There's too many lovers out there. I've heard people say that. Maybe I'm hearing people that you know, I'm hearing the worst of the worst, but I've heard people literally say, and they've tainted, tainted love, and they've said that they have so much love in their heart, they don't have enough just for one man. They have to spread it around because there's just so much, and, and they, they, they twist it to think that love is such, but it's a false love. It's not true love. True love is devoted to their lover. One. And they're true to Him. And they've pledged their loyalty to Him. And they've said to none else, there was no other but my one true love. And Song of Solomon is written in such a beautiful, passionate book of a, of a bride longing to be with her lover, her groom. And the groom saying, there's only but one bride for me. She is amongst all the other women, but I can see her out of them all. Amen. I'll close with this. I, I've not even preached what I planned to preach this morning. And our text was from Luke 19, and we preached from Song of Solomon. But it is what it is. But if you've ever been to Walmart, which I know every single one of you have, and I always try to go when there's not a lot of people, because Walmart, when it's busy is a horrible place to be. But when I'm at Walmart and we get split up between me and my wife, you know that you're beaconed in to find her. And this is how I, this is how I am. I usually take one or, one or two of the kids and I'll say, let's find your mom. And we're walking all over trying to find her. And you know what she looks like. And every now and then you can oh, oh, take a double glance because someone had a hair that looked kind of like them. But it, no, that ain't her. And you keep on looking down the aisles. And when you spot her, you found her. And you're not deceived easily by all the people that are around because you're, you're cued in to, to your wife. You're cued in to what she looks like. I've even before heard her speaking on the aisle over and I, oh, or she had a cough that day, and I heard her coughing. Oh, that's Lana's cough. Because I was cued into her. Yes. And let me tell you this morning, that's how we must be with Jesus Christ. There's none of, There are many lookalikes in this world. Oh, they try to look like Jesus, smell like Jesus, sound like Jesus. And it's only the true bride that knows the difference. Yes. How many of you know Jacob expected to marry Rachel, but he went unto Leah. He was deceived. He thought he was going to receive Rachel as his wife, but there was trickery that went on. Yep. And she kept the veil over her face and he didn't know. There was trickery. And the same trickery is going on today. Yes. There was a lookalike that it looks like Jesus and they say the name of Jesus but if it departs from the word of God from Jesus Christ and his blood at Calvary alone it is a false way and it's a lookalike and it's only the bride that knows the difference who will keep following the right path they said that there's a lot of false currency and money they'll print out false currency and these people who 
print false currency, will spend hundreds and thousands of dollars on machines to get them exact. And the only way that you can know the difference is not by studying the false one, but by knowing the real one. You all ever given a $20 and the lady puts it up like this to the light and uses that highlighter on it, makes you feel like they think you're a fraud? It's like, well, I ain't going to give you a false 20 if I... If it's fake, I, I'd throw it away. Well, they say that the, the, the good people that really know the difference are the ones who can study the real one. And they know the feel of it. And so when they're, hold, when they're handed a fake one, they know the real one so well yes. that they instantly know this is trash. Yeah, that's right. It's not worth the paper it's printed on. But it's those who are so busy touching all sorts of stuff. They're, they're blinded to it. They're not quite sure of the feel of the real one. And I want to know Jesus so intimately. I want to be His and He mine that you even bring up a false one in my presence. I'm going to say that's a lie and I don't want it. You take that lie with you to perdition because that's where it's headed. I'm following the real Jesus, the true Jesus, the one that was crucified for me, dead and buried and raised to life again and ascended on the right hand of God. When He comes back, He's coming for me. Amen. I ain't going to be left behind because I'm seeking the real one. And this world and the life that's in it isn't worth the life that I'm looking for. Amen. Amen. I don't want to be the one that says He won't reign over my life. He won't reign in me. Is that you? If you buy your heart with me.